Hey everyone, it's Louisa Tannemanson from Feel Good Astrology and I want to welcome you to another session of the Great Realizations videos where I'm very lucky to be joined by lots of different people who, in my eyes, are doing something really great in the world, um, be it in the intuitive realm, the social philosophy realm. You know, the people that I've invited to come and chat are people with something to share and with great gifts that I'm, you know, hoping to, um, I don't know, ease their message into the world a little bit more. You know, these are people who've inspired me along the way. And today, um, I'm really lucky to be joined here by Kimberly Jones, who I have known. How long have we known each other, Kimberly? It's quite a long time, isn't it? Yes, yeah, quite a few years. What, almost a decade? Yes, at least I would think. I mean, I knew, I think I met Carl in 2004, five, something like that. Yeah, so, so, so you know, Kimberly's been on my radar for, for many years and we've had quite a few chats on and off, um, you know, on online um, and obviously in person as well. And um, I've invited her here today to share a little bit about her thoughts about what's going on in the world right now um, and what these times have taught her and, and the meaning that she's got from this. Um, so anyway, here is Kimberly Jones. Um, Kim, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about what it is you think that I've invited you here for today. <laughs> Why am I interested in that? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> um, just thanks for inviting me and thanks for the work that you're doing and I will take any opportunity to chat with you. And um, yeah, what a lovely intro. I'm Kimberly Jones. Um, I have been called a soul midwife, so I'm happy to wear that label. I've been called a mystic. I'm happy to wear that one. Um, and I experienced a really powerful awakening about 22 years ago. A spiritual crisis that flipped my life on its head as was its intention and since then I've been integrating and making sense of that awakening and making sense of that shattering um, and learning and growing and falling apart again several times and losing everything several times and and so I find myself now in this situation um, sometimes gently offering one-to-one -one sessions with people. I said to Louisa just prior to us starting recording, I'm not selling anything, I'm not promoting anything. I'm just showing up. I haven't done video. I haven't done interviews for a really long time. This is why I've got stress neck going on. Um, but it's, it's time. And these, these big events that are happening in the world right now tend to be the things that call me out of my cave and out from underneath my duvet reluctantly. Um, and so I'm just showing up as um, a midwife, a messenger, a guide, a truth teller, and trying to make sense of what's happening alongside everyone else. But I have a bit of a shit hot team that I work with um, <laughs> in, in spirit, um, a divine crew, a soul squad, and they've stepped forward in the last six months big time and they won't let me ignore them anymore. So I'm stepping more into my work as a channel and a divine messenger wow that's an amazing amazing um kind of in a nutshell sort of description of of, of what you do and who you are um, so you're working really closely with your soul squad right now um, what do you make of what's going on in the world and, and and what have they shared with you well the shift has definitely hit the fan <laughs> And um, well, initially, when it all started, I mean, like you, I went into lockdown a few weeks before because yes. I, I, I knew it was coming. I knew something was coming. And it wasn't that I wanted to stay away from a virus necessarily. It was that I wanted to stay out of this uh, upswell of fear that I could feel coming. Mm -hmm. And I knew I, to, I knew I needed to take a step away from the, the collective public emotional experience so that I could... Uh, receive a, a different level of, of knowing about what was going on so initially it was very much about I was I was really pissed off initially because I knew we were being lied to so I went into that yeah. space and it was this kind of shakti fire truth telling really felt that I just wanted to rush toward my community and hold space for them to not get sucked into what this very powerful magnetic media message that was coming out Mm. Really, uh, and I just want I could feel that anyone who is in a space of 
self-doubt or not fully awake was was going to get sucked down that rabbit hole and i just felt this real sense of service and urgency to just create an alternative space for those people so i could say okay this might actually not be exactly what's going on um this is what i'm getting um so initially i started getting uh, lots of spontaneous remote viewing experiences which i think i mentioned to you in one of my messages yeah. a while yeah. ago and i've not you know, i don't think i've ever done any remote viewing what's what's it like how do you know you're going into it um gosh i mean it's it's like a, a movie screen overlaying itself or a superimposed like like my own green screen but it's mm -hmm. behind my eyes you know and um it's like very vivid imagination or very vivid when you're in a visualization or you're in a meditation sometimes people have images don't they and mm. uh, it's like that but very clear yeah and i get lots of information coming sensory knowing information as well so i can place myself somewhere and uh I'm very rusty, so this happened very spontaneously. Um, but I was trained to do it years and years ago with a shaman, psychic, amazing woman that could just see everything. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, she was helping me to discipline what was already there. I didn't yes. know that. I thought everyone could do it. You know, <laughs> I thought everyone could. I thought everyone could kind of see out the back of their head and yeah. knew what everyone was thinking or could like i would i would meet up with a friend and i would see them and, I, and then we'd say goodbye and i would see them walk to the car to their car get into their car drive home go in their front door have an argument with their husband uh, you know it would just be like it wasn't that i was peering and being nosy it would just but it, i just thought everybody did that you know i didn't realize wow. it was a thing and so um i suppressed i think a lot of it and um had some life stuff happen over the last few years and some health challenges and so i just did that i think it just died down to spare me the overstimulation and i i think i just shut it off a bit um so it burst open again around february um, march so it's it's kind of seeing images and getting information at the same time so um yeah i found myself in a lab and i found myself in a room with people and i found myself hearing conversations and i found myself receiving information um and it's pretty scary to kind of put it out there and um, risk being seen as a complete loon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, but this isn't my first rodeo, so I just thought, sod it, I'm just going to do it because I believe it and I'm, it feels true to me. And if it's going to help someone else, and lo and behold, you know, this information is coming out now, so it's nice to be validated. But the point is to, I think, trust our knowing without mm. needing the validation. And so it, it was a real test for me, I think, to trust that knowing without needing the validation or the approval or the pat on the back and just risk the response. And the response actually has been really positive and fantastic. And I realize as I've been releasing this, there's a, there's a, a private email series that people have to contact me if they want to receive them. It's not publicly available. Um, and the journey of releasing them has, has taken, well, it's taken me on through a process as well as the people um, reading them. Um, and, it's very much about trusting our inner knowing at this time for sure i mean the other thing to answer the question what do i think is going on i think it's a massive detox i think it's a massive purging a healing crisis yes i think there's a dark elite that's behind it all mm. but the real cause i think is that millions of us for and certainly going back 50 60 years have felt had this longing and this passion for a world built on love and transparency and truth and more and more people have been waking up and more and more people have been committing their life to this authenticity and a spiritual path and doing healing work and clearing their pain body and raising their vibration and doing all these wonderful things um, and that light that love brings up everything that isn't love yeah. we've created this wave of healing and transformation it's kind of be careful what you ask for you know and yeah. th this is the answer to a question that we forgot we asked this is the response to a prayer that people forgot they sent up repeatedly yes. every time they were agonizing over the state of the world or racism or lies or deceit or corruption every time we stood for something more and something bigger and something truer we were sending that vibe out there and so you know we've burst the pimple basically mm -hmm. and 
there are people who are, are instruments, I believe, behind, behind this. But the higher, deeper perspective is that they are simply playing that role of the shadow rising, the shadow yeah. purging, the shadow clearing, so that ultimately we can get the world that we've been asking for. Mm. And those of us that have been asking for a long time, I, f- I feel our role now is to hold space for this transformation to happen without getting pulled into the drama. I mean, yeah, feel the feels, the rage, the fear, the whatever, but mm. hold space as the light worker. I'm not even keen on that term anymore. I, I no. see myself. <laughs> yeah. I know I see myself yeah. A light worker, maybe when I was a little bit less embodied. Now I just see myself as a shit shoveler. It's more <laughs> of a kind of, <laughs> let's get this stuff out. Um, and responding with love and holding space, um, feeling what we're really feeling authentically as it's happening, but holding space for this massive detox to happen. Because, you know, when you sign up for a detox and you take your, your juice cleanse or whatever, you know, okay, I'm probably going to get a headache. I'm probably going to get some spots on my face. I'm probably going to ache. I'm probably going to feel tired. And you kind of you know, issues. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> two trips to the loo you know it's going to happen because you you've signed up for that but what we're seeing is that purging and releasing but people forgot that that's what they signed up for mm. that's not to minimize you know the difficulty and the pain that so many people are genuinely experiencing going through this but it's more painful when you don't know what's going on it's more painful when you don't realize that it's a kind of a, a part of a bigger process mm. but am i right in um in saying I mean this is true for me is that um I think I'm obviously dealing with my own sense of panic from time to time when I think oh my god this isn't going to go the way I'm expecting it to Um, Mm. then I also feel like I'm channeling um pain and fear and panic from other people as well I feel like it's all coming through me and for a while I kind of wanted to put it on a shelf um so I didn't have to deal with it like you, you look at your shelf and there's a load of trinkets of fear panic <laughs> you can't face it so you just kind of put it out the way but you always know that it's looking down on you somewhere <laughs> and and actually what I kind of need to do is like face the fear like I have some fears of um possibly um medical treatment being mandated and not being able to get out of it moreover I fear feel the fear and play it out in my head that it might happen to my children you know, and things like that. And they feel very, very real. And then I feel this like panic rise. And then I, and then it's, I, I feel so much more washing over me. And sometimes I think, I think this is coming from somewhere else. I, it doesn't just feel like mine anymore. And all the intuitives that I'm speaking to right now are tuning into so much of this. Is that kind of the same for you? Yeah. The first few weeks were definitely, as I say, I stepped back quite early because I knew as an empath, I was probably yeah. going to be hit by quite big waves of uh, picking up on the collective emotion and the collective yeah. response. And I am having my own re- reactions to it, my own emotions to it. Definitely. Yeah. I'm having a human experience here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but as well as that, um, and sometimes actually, sometimes I've had moments of completely losing my divine connection or not my divine connection, but my awareness of the big picture. And I've mm-hmm. needed to hurtle down into the anger and the fear. And, yeah. you know, my body is definitely, um, cause a few years ago I was diagnosed with complex PTSD. And so that's something that I, you know, I'm working on, isn't the right phrase, but loving and tending to gently, um, and so when things like this happen and there are certain energies flying around, you know, my body reacts in a rather explosive fashion. It's very, it's about as human as it gets, you know. So, you know, I've had to go there. I can't bypass it. I've had to go there and feel it. But yeah, definitely waves of the empathic kind of overload, um, overstimulation from social media, overstimulation from the, the media um, and mm. having to just, completely switch off from that at times and step back um and do my spiritual kung fu and use my energy <laughs> skills and just really armor up sometimes and then sometimes not at all just let my heart crack open and cry and and feel it um but yeah i mean asking the question is this mine i mean that's just a great tool right there because even just bringing the awareness to what you're feeling 
even the awareness to ask the question is this mine sometimes is enough for it to just or some of it to shift and so you can see what's left for you to process or for you to feel yeah that's a that's a good observation um yeah <laughs> it's it's um been one of the grittiest times i've ever known actually i'll be honest say grittiest grittiest but i mean you know um other words that rhyme with grittiest would also be applicable I'm thinking, yeah. <laughs> so um what what changes have these times brought about for your your practice and and your day-to-day -day living and what you've seen in in your friends and also clients i think essentially my work has shifted from personal to planetary mm -hmm. just it's um, you know for the last little bit of time i've been doing one-to-one -one tarot sessions and energy transmissions for people in very focused very specific personal questions and and issues yeah. very much zooming in and so what's shifted is i'm zooming out and so even the one-to-one -one sessions actually there's just this bigger context and so everything that they're bringing to me is now within this bigger context and they're aware of it now, whereas they might not have been aware that their personal experiences were part of a bigger context before now. So I can just go a bit more wide angle with the work, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm noticing that actually um, astrologically is that um, the, the kinds of um, clients that are coming to me and also the problems or um, kind of guidance that people are seeking really kind of matches what's going on in in the bigger picture there's a what i'm noticing is a lot of um mother issues and parent issues right now and it does kind of feel like we've got abusive parents in the form of um govern government and governing and um the powers that be it almost feels like there's an unhealthy parent relationship going on if that makes sense but i've been noticing all the way throughout it's it's really mirrored like never before <laughs> So it kind of reassures me, actually, that we're getting to the parent issues. Um, yes, yes. And I mean, this, this recognition. Yeah. Yeah. recognition of it, yeah. And, and what I was going to um, sort of reflect back to you about that was, you know, that part of the awakening journey in my experience is that this phase you go through of reparenting yourself. Yes. In process, yeah, and in the process of becoming autonomous and having spiritual sovereignty and mm. reparenting yourself and healing the mother wound and healing the father wound. And of course, we've got some fantastic, um, fantastic global leaders playing, you know, perfectly the role of the narcissistic sociopathic father or, you know, um, <clears throat> just to push those buttons. Um, and something, a phrase I use is reclaiming our power and, and reclaiming our personal power. And, and the bigger version of that is that soul retrieval and reclaiming those bits of ourselves that we might have given away, not even realised that we've given away or that have been taken from us with, to systems and um, social expectations and power figures and mm -hmm. education and the financial system and just the way the world is set up it's the way the world is set up it, it's not set up for us to be sovereign beings definitely it it's, it's kind of rigged isn't it not kind yeah, it, of either it's it, definitely it's rigged. <laughs> But it's set up perfectly for codependency and an unhealthy codependency. And then we have these narcissistic figures sometimes playing, you know, the role of, of leader. So this is what I mean by the kind of the zooming in and the zooming out, because a lot of my clients over the last few years have been people who relate to the sacred union journey or the twin flame journey, which, I mean, describe it how you like, think a bit, think of it however you like, judge it however you like. But essentially for me, what that journey is, is people who have experienced narcissistic abuse are perhaps codependent in nature um, and have an, an are not self-sourcing. And so the journey is back to self, back to source and back to sovereignty. Mm. And so people who have been on that path actually are pretty well set up to be able to see clearly what's going on and to not feel anymore that, um, well, not completely. I mean, there are still a lot of people struggling but uh, and learning and growing. But I'm noticing they're at a point now where they're going, wow, yeah, six months ago, actually, if I hadn't done this codependency work and this reparenting work, I can see how this that's happening would be so much more re-traumatizing and mm. triggering. Because they're in their own power now. You've, you've just touched on loads of things there that have really resonated, like um, 
Um, one thing I've been talking about with all of my clients actually um, for the last few months is the refinding, like the reunification of parts that we've lost along the way through shame or embarrassment, you know, where we've been peer pressured out of ourselves. And like, obviously you and I are quite familiar with those kinds of things because I had to reclaim that part of me that was a little bit like a, a witch, you know, <laughs> left-handed redhead, you know, <laughs> that, that kind of your work with a witch wound, you know, the idea that people um, get like that, that part of them that might be intuitive or a little bit feared is, is, is peer pressured and shamed out of them. And so a lot of clients I've noticed have been kind of picking up parts of themselves and learning to love those parts that they dropped off and learning to reintegrate them back into their system. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it, it strikes me that Carl would really fit in well in this conversation, but sadly he's looking after the kids at the moment. But um, one thing that we've, we've um, fallen out a few times, obviously over these last, um, I was going to say six months then, but like three months of intense kind of lockdown situation. We've, um, we've had fallings out every now and again when I've said, you know, this is how I'm feeling. And he said, well, yeah, well, you would because you've got you've got parent issues or you've got this issue or that issue. Or we talk about other people and um, he said, well, I, I can tell you exactly what it is. All of these people that are believing in conspiracy theories, it's because they've got parent issues. And so he's boiled everything down to parent issues and unresolved trauma. And actually at some level, I think he's right. But when I hear him say it so clearly, it, it sounds kind of offensive because it, it almost like belittles the experience that people are having right now. But um, yeah, I, I see the people who are trusting the narrative are ones who are very trusting of the environment that they grew up in. So people that kind of um, were popular, didn't really experience bullying or any kind of, um, you know, people that had a kind of normal um, experience of being accepted um, seem much more believing of what's going on right now because they, they trust the system that they've been brought up in. But do you, do you, do you resonate with that or does that kind of, I mean, I don't want to say that, you know, there are some people that are trusting the narrative and some aren't because I can see that people are squirming a little bit now because it's so in their face that things aren't as clear cut. I do think trauma is behind it. Um, yeah. But I think it's more nuanced, I think, than, um, <laughs> It's because I could totally hear where you and Carl are both coming from because yeah. yes, it, my my perspective is that the people that are not willing to go there and look at what might be really going on, I don't mean in the conspiracy theory way, sometimes just in the deeper spiritual kind of a way as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they just haven't they haven't had their nut cracked. You know, they're just quite intact. Um, mm. And sometimes I envy them, and I'm like feel a bit jealous you know <laughs> in those moments when I just think oh it'd be quite nice to go back to sleep for a minute um so what I see is that yes if people have been traumatized and they haven't necessarily done the work or they're not aware that they're traumatized then they get stuck in the mummy daddy wounds and the projection mm. people that have been cr fully cracked open through trauma done the work some of the work or certainly to the point where they have that observer consciousness and they can look at things big picture and then they still have the trauma they still maybe had parent issues but they can now see they now have that mindful mm -hmm. awareness of that dynamic so yeah I think it like I say I think it's quite nuanced but certainly the people that are buying everything they're told um they ain't like me that's all it is really <laughs> just not like me and but like i said i envy them to a certain extent um and yeah. you know not not everyone's here to be kind of shaken awake um everyone's here to play a different role yeah absolutely but there's definitely i mean wounds play a part don't they all the way you know we could talk for hours about wounding and the pain body and how we have you know see the world through our wounding until we don't yeah uh, and project our wounds onto the world until we don't and so yeah some of it's projection i think um some of it's projection i mean certainly um i've tried to avoid dipping into too many of the uh, really angry kind of conspiracy theory type mm. videos 
um, just because I'm not sure there's anything there that I really need. Yeah. Uh, and I can, and I, but I think the rage and the anger and that wounding is part of, part of the process. You know, I'm like, knock yourself out, but I don't want to be in that energy field at the moment. Um, I do think it's important. I think that for some people, it's that level of stimulation and that level of uh, rage that that cracks them open, that wakes them up, that they use it as fuel to kind of create change before they find a different fuel to create change. Yeah. Mm. Yes, I can see that happening. Um, definitely. Definitely. Um, cognitive dissonance is the phrase of the day yeah i mean i can awesome. i mean i can have conversations about things with um this is what i mean about kung fu being a bit kind of kung fu -y because you know i'm talking with you or i'm talking with clients and there are, there's a certain way i can talk about this and then when i'm talking to maybe a neighbor or um someone who is just an adorable muggle mm. um it bounces off, you know, there are earmuffs is how I used to describe it. Foggy goggles and earmuffs. Mm. And sometimes in the past, I thought it was my job to crack those open and break those <laughs> away. You know, wake people up in my arrogance and ignorance. Um, it's easy and, to uh, go there though, isn't it? Because when you do kind of yeah. um, notice that there are some inconsistencies in life, and obviously we've been taught from an early age that actually everything is okay, there's nothing to see here. Um, when you do kind of notice for the first time that, um, you know, maybe we've been lied to, um, uh, you know, the first thing you want to do is go and tell everyone, isn't it? Once you've got over the shock of it, you just want to tell people and, and, and see if people are, are with you or not, you know? Um, and that's normally when you find out that you're on your own. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I know you have all this knowing and nobody really gives two hoops they don't want to hear it but yeah. i think that's that and again that's i think i think carl alluded to it in his conversation with you about that evangelical phase that you can go through on the awakening yes. path, or when you have a knowing or a realization or something that you're passionate about mm. especially when the stakes are so high you're like why is nobody listening yeah like the survival of people is pretty big isn't it <laughs> Yeah. And so, yeah, I've got that, that bit of me, that evangelical Edna and Ernest Ernie, as William Bloom describes his as Ernest Ernie. Uh, <laughs> evangelical Edna sometimes, or egotistical Edna. Yeah. Yeah. Um, recognize that character as well. <laughs> I'd be lying if I pretended I didn't. Um, so like, how have these times changed your, your, your clients and when you've been talking to them or, or their practices and, what differences have you noticed? I think the main insights come from the feedback to the emails, the lockdown diaries that I've been sharing, and that's people coming back and um, it's not as if they're learning anything new. I'm just sharing what I'm experiencing, sensing um, what my team are sharing. And they're coming back feeling very validated. They're feeling like they can trust their inner knowing and their intuition more. They're feeling more autonomous. They're feeling all the feelings and the emotions but finding it really helpful to know that there might be a, a deeper thing that's playing out on the planet here and um yeah i'm just seeing more people recognizing that they're more aware than they thought they were mm. uh, and actually this witch wound thing keeps coming up as well because they're feeling and sensing particularly in the early weeks really sensing the offness of what was playing out but didn't necessarily have the vocab or trust themselves enough to say anything and if they did dare to say anything to their family they're getting really kind of gaslighted or attacked or mm. crazy or ignored or shut down or and so they're looking for a space to feel validated and to feel seen and to understand what it is they're sensing about what's going on mm. in the world um because my i mean my clients generally run from kind of the early kind of questioners through to people that have been walking some kind of an awake path for a really long time so it's the relative newbies that are having the biggest shifts the ones that have been walking a path of some kind for a really long time they've already had their world fall apart several times in their mm -hmm. lives so 
so they kind of feel like it's their life has prepared them for this heightened phase that we're in and so then what they're receiving is encouragement to step up maybe in more of a leadership role in their own lives with yes. what they already know yeah it's funny because um i've spoke in fact everyone i've spoken to um in recording the series um whether on screen or off screen they've all said this feels like the time i came here for um yeah yeah and you're right that's why you know Carl and i kind of locked down before we locked down in portugal and and we locked down in portugal before they did in, in the uk um it wouldn't have surprised me if you and i actually went into lockdown at the same time but um we felt it coming and we said this is the time we come you came yeah yeah i'm hearing that a lot nice to instantly um yeah. see something was about to blow up and and i think um it, it, it feels to me like the emphasis of um, COVID has been changed to um, inciting anger and upset, you know, um, between people like humanity in general. And I'm just wondering, you know, what the next phase will be. Um, you know, it just, I feel like there's this massive distraction act going on. Have you seen the Netflix um, Magic for Humans? Have you ever watched that? If you watch Netflix, it's worth watching. Sky, okay. he's a really good magician and he's really easy to watch. He's very funny, very cool. Um, and he's not like one of those snar snidey, slightly narky ones. He's, he's funny. He's, he's, he's got a nice heart, or he seems to. Um, but he's, he really epitomises the nothing to see here. You know, he does, he, he does this really great little distraction and then all of a sudden you see that the reality you've, you've observed just wasn't true at all and that he's played with you. And I really yeah. see what's going on right now. It really feels like there's this nothing to see here. Look over this way. <laughs> and yes. and yes. I really, every time I, I don't watch the news, but I, I, I get it secondhand from Carl or I'll be walking past the room as I hear it in the background. And I just feel this something in my in my heart or my stomach and I think oh my god there's another wave of it you know I can I can I can feel something in it and and I feel so opposed to it even before I've heard the details you know this feels really off and I just think oh so much so much being brewing something's being manipulated yeah absolutely yeah I wrote about it in the last episode of the lockdown diaries actually about how it goes back to the time of Caesar and um really yeah. can you tell us yeah. a little bit about that now yeah, well, it's, um, they called it the time of bread and circuses. So it was the, you know, the gladiators and the stadiums keeping the masses occupied, um, shouting for their winner and shouting, you know, yelling and screaming and whooping at the, at the gladiators and um, eating bread when they were starving. So they could go there, they could eat, they could have entertainment. Meanwhile, Caesar's off doing his business, you know, um, and pulling strings and manipulating society. To, you know for his own ends and it so it's not new there's nothing new about what's going on it's yeah. a and you know no doubt some of the people involved are students of said former leaders and um hungry so um, bread and circuses then so there's a yeah, big no, when was, well when i was at uni um that was my first big kind of uh realizing that you know the world wasn't quite as it seemed in terms of corruption and manipulation. So I was studying history of design, visual arts and with social and political history. And we were doing a, a year of graphics, history of graphics, history of media. And um, oh God, it makes me angry even now. So it's obviously still there. Um, <laughs> it was learning that way back in the 19, sort of 20s, 30s, 40s, the beginning of um, advertising and um, media advertising as we know it now, um and some of the very first ad agencies hired sigmund freud as a consultant right with the specific purpose of understanding human impulse and human drives and the deepest of human vulnerabilities and insecurities so that the advertising agency could manipulate those uh, drives <sighs> insecurities specifically to sell products i mean that seems like a no-brainer these days we kind of know it's happening but but yeah. you know i mean 30 years ago i was so angry you know i was grieving i was raging yeah. 
Um, and in the same year, we went to the Design Museum in London and I learned about inbuilt obsolescence and that these, you know. These oh, ooh, that gets me <laughs> raging. <laughs> all kinds of reasons, right? Yeah. yeah. But um, then I, it was just knowing that these companies had the technology, they had the know how and the technology to create things that could last a lifetime, and yet they chose to build things that would run out after a specific period just so that they could make money. And oh, mm. gosh. So that's what university is supposed to do, I suppose, crack you open in that way. But that was the first time that I realised that there was this manipulation and misdirection going on simply to serve a capitalist agenda. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing now. It's just had yeah. to be... Well, we're, we're seeing it unchecked after 30 years, and it's actually a lot longer than 30 years, isn't it? 30 years for me since I found out at university is what I yeah. mean. You know, that this was kind of kicking off. But obviously it you know, goes back to Caesar. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Wow. So um, what are your great realisations then? Like summing up the last um, short while that this has been going on. Um, you know, what, 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 what thoughts have kept you going or helped you um, make sense of it? I think, well, everything we've shared already, but mainly I think what you shared about what you and Carl sensed was just that, oh, okay, this is what it's all been for. <laughs> yeah. like, get up, get dressed, put your shoes on, buckle up, buttercup. It's time for action. This mm. is why you're here. Um, and suddenly realising why the last couple of years have unfolded as they have and why I suddenly had this you know, new computer, get all my files sorted, get my spare room sorted, get myself, just get myself ready to work, to go to work really. Try and get myself fit again, get myself healthy, all these things over the last few years. Ah, okay, game on. Right, so it's, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. I actually, um, um, when, when, when it dawned on us that um, the time is now, I said to Carl, oh no, I thought I'd be further along. <laughs> you know, I thought, <laughs> I thought yeah. we might be in a better financial position or we might have yeah. made ourselves a few advantages before this all kicked in. Um, and so I felt a little bit ashamed that I hadn't like moved on a bit further or had more connections within the world so that I could reach more people or help more people. Um, but actually I realised that I've got more than I can cope with right now. <laughs> it's a bloody good job I've <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. I totally hear you. And then I keep hearing this. Is it Arthur Ashe quote? Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Is it Arthur Ashe? Ah, I love that. Say that again. I think it's start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. I'm definitely doing that. Start where you are. Yes, got no choice. Use what you have. Do what you can. Well, that's actually definitely what I'm doing. Um, yeah, quite right. Yeah, we both feel very um, much um, at service or wanting to help in any way, shape or form. So kind of just staying open to what transpires, what comes up. Yes, and of course, it's no mistake, the two of you being together. You know, you have the cosmic and the communicator and you put the two together. It's very powerful. <laughs> yes. Well, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it works quite well. Wow. So um, can I ask you an extra question? Um, I'm kind of keen to, to know what you think, like where you think we're going. Like if you could put money on it, like if you're a betting person, what do you think, what do you think we can look forward to in this, um, I'm going to use the term shit show or, you know, in this bread and circus. What do you think's about to happen? Well, I think at the moment we're, we're moving into a really dark phase of polarisation. We're going to yeah. see extremes and a stretching of the elastic band, which will eventually snap. Mm. So we're, I, think, I don't think we're at the fullest stretch yet. No, I don't either. But see it, aren't we? Actually, the next lockdown diaries, I'm thinking about just going full force into the channeling of the future vision because um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of saving it and... Um, um if i go far enough ahead it's golden age vibes and it's what a lot of us carry the blueprint of within us already um and i'm prepared 
to plant seeds of trees I may never see grow. Um, and it may be beyond our lifetime, but I, my feeling is that this, this is an, uh, an acceleration. And so we may well in the next 50 years really start to see the golden age start to manifest and the things that a lot of us just stand for and hold in our heart already as how we want to live start to get easier to do mm. i think there'll be a transition phase where it's harder to do where um you know the the ego death of the old patriarchal paradigm has its last death throes and clings on for its last semblance of power and so the you know trying to apply these um, controls whether it's mandatory vaccination or whatever but we're already seeing and this is the thing that those people expressing the shadow that have perhaps been part of instigating what's going on weren't prepared i don't think for quite how many people on the planet are already very awake and just not taking any of it and i think that's why we're seeing all this ducking and diving because they're like, blimey, people are a little bit more awake than we thought. They're more informed than we thought. They're more cohesive than we thought. They're more vocal than, you know, and you can have, you can throw all the behavioral scientists in the world at what's going on, but ultimately that, you know, the human spirit will, will prevail. And mm. this is why I think a lot of us are stepping back just through the rough patch. Um, and then there'll be a time when we need to really step forward and, and lead a little bit more in obvious uh, practical ways obviously initially within our local community and for that community that virtual community that we might already be connected with um but yeah i've definitely had flash forwards and future visions of but it's been more of a sensory it's been more of a, a heart opening and feeling people walking around with their guard down and their hearts open and their, all their swords down and that, that connection that so many of us long for and um that source energy that uh, grounding of the light and um, cooperation and sense of family and just a really heightened sense of that Christmas feeling and that when it snows feeling and um, that kind magic. of toast. magic heart opening connection love I mean it's essentially that's what we're growing towards is realizing that that's what we're here for and that's what we're made of um, and the extremes just make it possible for us to value that more want that more stand for it more so um we may not see it in its entirety in our lifetime then <laughs> you know, i wasn't expecting this um i mean kind of was but wasn't i mean i wasn't expecting it to be so you know I, i'm i've been told that this is an acceleration of what was the original timeline mm. uh, so who knows I, I do feel it's a big course correction a divine intervention in some way yeah uh, not to go all bypassy on it but i just i just i do feel that perhaps this uh has been brought forward a little bit um which is why so many of us many of us are thinking wish i had a bit more money uh wish i was a bit healthier mm. um i've got that sorted and that sorted that's why a lot of us are thinking that because it has i think been brought forward um mm. talking timelines yeah so i think it could be exponential um i feel like i'm i feel like i'm gonna see it in this lifetime i just don't think i'm gonna see it necessarily in in its fullness i think there'll be enough for us to kind of feel like oh, finally that's what yeah. i mean it's, it's all and then what do you what do you see as the role of money do you get a, a sense of what because like one of the things that um sorry we've got um what looks like a refuse truck has just passed outside <laughs> You know, they come at like 10 o'clock at night around here. Wow. You'd that in England, would you? But in Portugal. Like it. it's, it's crazy. Um, so, um, like, I think one of the things that a lot of people are able to um, use excuses over is the fact that they don't have enough money and people often feel very under-resourced and for their survival, a lot of people will do pretty much anything for money um and then along the way we learn actually where our limits are um you know i've left jobs that i felt un, you know out of alignment with but i my concern is if we are <laughs> sorry about the noise if um if we are um impoverished more than we already are and to really really bad times and 
I think my worry is that our behavior is going to get worse and worse because people's reaction to survival is going to be really peaked. Yeah. So I, I just wonder what the role of money is like. Well, what, what do you see? What do you think about money? Well, I think any survival fear is what's being played on. Um, so, you know, everything that we've already said stands in trying to kind of work towards our own sovereignty and our autonomy emotionally anyway, or spiritually initially, um, so that we are not triggered, so that the those survival, because I mean, gosh, I mean, for me personally, I can completely see how my survival fears get triggered. I mean, even in the initial weeks when... I chose to go into isolation and I couldn't get my shopping, I couldn't get my food shopping and I couldn't get my usual stuff delivered. And, mm. you know, even a lovely local grocer wasn't delivering and, Oh, I definitely felt, I definitely felt stuff come up. Mm. But for me, that what that gave me was an opportunity to first of all, think more simply about how I was living mm. and realize what, what I really do need and what I don't need and what I was using as an emotional crutch. Yeah. Also, how was I isolating myself in other ways that weren't necessary? So from my neighborhood, from my local resources, from, my, from a local support network that was just sitting there waiting to be tapped into, but which I'd become disconnected from because I was so used to having my shopping delivered, you know. Mm. And so what it took was for me to reach out to my neighbors and friends locally, ask for help. And then they sent me phone numbers for the local council and the town council. And then I realized actually there were loads of shops in, locally and farm shops and that were delivering food. It just meant I had six deliveries of lovely people showing up with their boxes of wares instead of one big, you know, Sainsbury's van or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so it, it forced me to just, you know, adjust my way of living and my expectation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, I know what you're saying and I suspect it would be a, you know, a bigger version of that for a lot of people. Mm. Um, but again, it's, it's forcing us in a, in a direction. So if people are struggling financially, it forces you in a particular direction. You know, it, the, the, the water will find its way through the rock somehow. It will find yeah. its way. It will find its way through. And it's all, it's all part of that process of bringing, our, bringing us back to ourselves and looking at how we're consuming and, and I know that we've got things like Bitcoin and digital, you know, currency and all this kind of hovering around the edges. And again, I think we might see a polarization of wealth, you know, um, initially, like that elastic band stretching. Um, I think we might see the people that are quite awake and aware and heart centered um, embodying more of one of um, Carl's favorite sayings of just people helping people. Mm -hmm. taking money out of the equation you know you might have four or five people in that circle who are all scratching each other's backs and exchanging support and services and, and whatever i've seen a lot of that locally that i haven't seen before um people needing things yeah i'll do that for you if she does that for me and then we'll do that for that and then you know um and just taking money out of the equation in that in that yeah. regard i'm not a financial expert but i i can kind of see the trends and see where it's going mm. emotionally energetically spiritually and in terms of us coming back to ourselves and being self-sourcing and if there's a financial crisis or a health crisis or a relationship crisis or a housing crisis or an employment crisis my experience is that whatever form that takes it's ultimately served me in the most amazing way mm. it didn't look like it at the time <laughs> yeah of course the hindsight never you know we never get the hindsight the benefit of hindsight straight away do we we have to kind of go through our transformation first yeah we can say yeah. oh that's the reason why that relationship or whatever that situation was didn't work out yes and for me i've had financial struggle to teach me to ask for help mm. teach me to not cut myself off from people in that in that way yeah um and also to understand for me personally that um, finances flow for me when I'm more grounded and connected to the earth literally you know might be getting out in nature and gardening growing mm -hmm. stuff and I'm connected to divine source so the other thing I wanted to share was that that's on a spiritual level I feel that that's what's going on is that we're shifting from this horizontal dependence on 
outside resources to feel whole mm. to more of this connecting to earth connecting to source connecting to heart connecting to soul and then connecting to each other from from that place so so many of us have defined our value and our worth on the stuff that we can get hold of and the stuff that we can surround ourselves with and so you know if there is a higher power behind all of this that wants to show us how magnificent and amazing and abundant we are standing naked in a field with nothing we are enough if we are to be shown that what better way than to strip away all the things that we've been dependent on to fill that void mm. and steer us in the direction of plugging back into source reconnecting to ourselves the earth and each other in a meaningful way and then perhaps the abundance starts to flow again but not while we're clinging on to it yeah <laughs> yeah well would you like to come and talk to me another time about this maybe in more months time when we can go oh my god i can't believe what's just happened <laughs> yeah, let's do that. yeah let's do that let's check in again later yeah see what's unfolding well um if somebody wants to reach out to you um or to work with you or just to say hi or you know say you're gorgeous <laughs> or whatever you know if someone wanted to reach you kim Kimberly, how can they reach you? What's the best way? Kimberlyjones.co.uk. Perfect. Kimberlyjones.co.uk. Well, L E Y at the end of Kimberly. Yeah, I, I will post it. You know, when when I um, post this video, I will um, absolutely post it. So um, I would absolutely love to thank you so much for your time today. Really, it, it we should catch up a lot more often than we do. It's nice to see you, you know, rather than us like type messages to each other. It's really, really nice to see you again. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, um, I'd just like to thank anyone who has listened in um, today. Um, if you've got any questions for us, um, you can reach Kimberly um, at kimberlyjones.co.uk or you can reach me, it's Louisa at feelgoodastrology.com. Um, yeah stay connected um if you'd like this video then please feel free to um subscribe hit the notification bell and all that kind of malarkey anyway um oh i've got to say goodbye and, and go and do some stuff but kimberly it's, it's been an absolute pleasure it's been magnificent thank you so much for your time today thank you my lovely thank you so much